So we have the honor and, and the pleasure um, to have uh, Professor Eckhout uh, from uh, UPF Economics Department and also the Barcelona School, Graduate School of Economics. And um, he's a leading scholar uh, working on uh, the implications of market structures from different dimensions. And as far as I could see, you've dealt with the green economy and with the urban <laughs> planning. <laughs> and, and, and also, um, and also on, on labor markets, which I understand is one of your focus. So he's going to be talking about his uh, book that he just published, that it's called The Profit Paradox. Um, and uh, he hopes, and I hope also, that that raises some discussion on the legal issues that um, that come with this uh, market dynamics. So thank you very much, and the floor is yours. My pleasure. Is it not mine if I take my mask? Off? Yes, absolutely. For me, at least, yes. Okay, so, so first of all, um, I'm very interested to, to also hear what uh, you have to say. I, I'll go more into detail about it because there's an issue, I think, related to a legal aspect. I've talked to a couple of lawyers, mainly competition lawyers, about this, and I think it's, it's very much an, an, an open issue that uh, uh, I think you have many more uh, interesting things to say about it. So I, in the end, I hope to come away uh, learning more than I think you will learn from me, but I, I, I'm uh, really looking forward to, to that discussion. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the main issues that uh, are in the book, and then, then I'll, I'll hope to come to the, the, the discussion. Um, to introduce the, the issue in the, the profit paradox, I usually like to use, a, especially if you're in a university like this, uh, a parallelism from, uh, uh, from education. Um, to basically kind of uh, uh, make a connection with, with uh, what, what is really the, the, the main issue of market power in, in the macro economy. And so the parallelism I use is I, use, I usually say that if, if you look at, you know, one kid being bullied by another kid, then one kid suffers. If, if a teacher doesn't care, then, well, maybe 20 or 25 kids suffer. When an education system is broken, then, you know, millions suffer. And so I think there's something here that is going on in uh, the, I would say, the macro economy, which is really something about a system that's broken. And, you know, I'm going to show you a number of facts and statistics which are economy-wide. Um, I start also, I, I link these two experiences of individual people, and, and, and in the book I talk about some of these. One of the issues is that, you know, very much contrary to what people's perceptions are, um, startups are much less common, and there's fewer of those now than there were, uh, say, four decades ago. I always say four decades ago because the turning point, I'm going to come to that uh, in, in greater detail, is 1980, where a lot of facts start to have different kind of trends. In economics, we call them secular trends because you know, secular in the sense that in economics, we look very much at short-term issues, maybe business cycle e events, which is about five to 10, maybe 12 years. And then secular is beyond that. And it can be, you know, it could be uh, centuries, but here four decades is for economists is secular and, and to a large extent also because that's the data that we have. And so one of these secular trends I'm going to come back to is, is the, the issue of startups. Um, I know Firstly, a case of a person who had a startup who's failed. You say, well, startups are supposed to fail and they, they, they fail. But it's not just that one kind of case. It's what we find in the data is that there's a, there's a systematic change in the startup. This is a counterintuitive effect because if you think, you know, in a current day and age with, you know, digital, digital technology, this is the day and age of startups. And especially in Silicon Valley, that's where most of the startups are. So you would think... This is a time where we see most of the startups. And I'm going to argue that, I'm going to show you that that's not, not the case. And the same thing, and a big fact is something related to wages. You would think, okay, we have a lot of progress. We see a lot of, of technological progress. At the same time, we don't see wages evolve in the same way. And so the, the, the point of the book is that there's something that's, you know, broken, that there's a system that's broken, okay? And that system, I'm going to argue, has to do with the fact that there's actually too little competition. 
too little competition in a, a number of markets. And so um, it's basically, why is it called the profit paradox? It's called the profit paradox because on the one hand, you see firms doing extremely well, having high profitability, and at the same time, a number of other firms, typically smaller firms, startup firms, doing not so well, and basically the labor market where we see a number of consequences which are related to wage stagnation, which are related to uh, wage inequality. And so let me show you a number of facts here to start. Yes, you can. But I think Should I? Yes, you're right. Ah, that's why it has to be. No, I mean, the cursor has to be on, on the. Yes, that's fine. I think it should work. And if this works. I think we cannot see anything on, on no, Zoom. No, no, it's fine. It works, yes. So, so the, the, first, I'm, the first one I'm going to show you, um, some of these pictures are going to be covered by the... Uh, by the... This, the, the column? But I mean, it's, it's fine with me. Put it on the camera. You can take this out. I have it, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, really. Do you want me to look at some? No, it's okay. That's fine. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so just to illustrate the profit paradox, I'm going to show you the, the evolution of the Dow Jones. This is the Dow Jones adjusted for inflation. Okay, from the Second World War, it's actually from 48 onwards until today. And why the Dow Jones? Well, first of all, it's, a, it's an index that we see and talk about often. Okay? It's uh, non-representative, like many of these indices, even the S&P 500 is not uh, representative, the NASDAQ is not representative. So these are all just indices. This is for the United States. It's also true for, for other countries. What I want to show with this is that you know, the stock market valuation gives us an idea of what the profitability is of firms. Why? Because Ultimately, the stock market valuation is what you as an investor expect to get in dividends, and dividends are going to be paid out, maybe not simultaneous with when profits are realized, but ultimately they must come from profits. Because if a firm doesn't make profits, it can never pay out dividends. So the, the, the stock market valuation is basically the future expected profits of the firm. Okay. And so what we see, if you look at the evolution, and again, I can't get it to move. Um, Mireya, can you put the cursor again? Yeah, that's right. Now, if you click, that's fine. Now it will work. Then it will fine. Um, so what you see in terms of the Dow Jones is that until 1980, in fact, in 1981, the Dow Jones was exactly at the same level as in 1948. Not many people will believe this. Okay, this is adjusted for inflation. Remember that in the 1970s we had a, a high uh, uh, inflation. So basically, you know, that's why it looked that it, it was going up in nominal terms and not in real terms. Okay, the big increase of the Dow Jones comes after the 80s, and in particular after the Great Recession, in fact, starting in 2009. Okay, and in fact, the biggest of all increases is the last few years. If you look at uh, Apple, was the first company to get uh, through the one trillion valuation, which was in uh, 2018. You know, through the pandemic, two and a half years later, Apple's valuation was three trillion. Okay, it tripled in two and a half years. I mean, tripling is really, you don't see that very often on that. Uh, um, now, this is, of course, only an individual firm. By the way, the Dow Jones is only 30 firms. But that's the whole point of the profit paradox. You see profitability of a number of firms, but it's a very select group of firms. Okay? Even if you go to, say, the S&P 500, where you see 500 firms, that's also still a very select group of firms. Why? Because you have to be big and profitable to be in that group. In the United States, there's 6 million firms. So if you talk about 30 or 500, this is just peanuts compared to the total number of firms in the whole world. There's about over 100 million estimated uh, number of firms. So what the point of this is that, OK, there's high profitability of some firms. OK, it's important to stress some firms, not for all firms. In fact, if you look at the data, you know, the profitability of most firms, in fact, the median firm goes down. 
the profitability of some firms goes up a lot, so you get very much the distribution of profitability spreading out uh, a lot. So then what's going on here? What, or, or where is the paradox? Well, let's just look at this is, if you want the distribution of what a firm's accounts look like and, and by extrapolation, what an economy's account look like. This is the surplus. This is not a firm's literal account because it takes out what you use as inputs produced by other firms. But basically, you spend on workers, on, on labor, you spend on machines. That's all kinds of investments. So it could be also, it doesn't have to be machines. It could be software or things like that. And then whatever is left over is profit. And usually, and this is what you know, uh, has become uh, called a stylized spec is that workers get about two thirds, machines one third or a little bit less, and then whatever's left over is profits. In 1981, about 2% were profits. What has happened since then is that this share of profits has grown, okay? This is consistent with this Dow Jones going up. But again, this is the average profits. So if we say now in 2019, profits are 14% of the surface of GDP, you can think of this. Okay, then really what this means is that this is the average. So a few firms are going to have much higher profits and most of the firms still have low profits as before. Okay, so it's important to see that this is not the same, you know, even though I give you averages, not all firms are like this average firm. This is now looking at how things are divided. Let's look at what happened to these startup firms. Let's now look at these smaller firms. Okay. If we start in the late 70s, as I mentioned earlier, the number of startups, the percentage of startups, that is all firms that are basically new firms, either one year or five year old, you can measure it in different ways. In the late 70s, about just under 14% of all firms were new firms. If you look at what it is now, this has fallen to under 8%. Okay, we see an enormous drop in the, the, the number of startup firms. Again, as I said before, this is a little bit counterintuitive because you would think in this day and age of innovation, digital companies, we talk about startups all the time. This is not what you think. And in fact, if you want to be unpopular at a cocktail party, you say this, people are going to say, I'm not believe. Okay, because it's true, people don't believe this. People really don't believe this, that, that in Silicon Valley, there's even in Silicon Valley, by the way, if you look by geography, there's fewer startups now than there were uh, 30, 40 years ago. So that's an implication just to stress what this means for all types of firms. You have this high kind of profitability of some firms, but some other firms don't even get to the market. Why that is, is because these dominant firms, in a way, compete away the smaller firms. This can be purely because they're much more productive and therefore they do much better, and some of this is true. There are less kind of uh, benign ways in doing it. There's a lot of what they call killer acquisitions, which is firms take over, dominant firms take over small firms just to kill them, okay? to make sure that they don't compete, they no longer exist, they have their portfolio of patents, they, have, they take their kind of engineers or their, their uh, uh, executives and they just put them on different projects. Okay. Um, so so that, that's what's going on with startups. Now let's take a look at, at wages. What has happened to wages? So if you look at the evolution of wages, again, starting in the Second World War, and I'm gonna compare it to the evolution of productivity. We can talk about how it's measured, but basically think of the productivity in the economy and now look at the wages. Now, what I'm going to show you is wages for around 90% of the workers, not everyone, okay? Because there's an issue I'm going to show you in, in a graph after this, where we look at the distribution of, of wages. So this is basically for everyone who's in production or services. It excludes basically managers. So if you look at the evolution of wages since the Second World War, what happened is that productivity and wages went together. And then in 1980, wages started to stagnate. So what happened is that from 1980 onwards, the wages stopped growing. And this is again in real terms. Now, you know, again, many people wouldn't believe that the wages in 1980, that's, that's basically our parents or grandparents' wages, that they're the same. But this is for the same type of jobs, okay? For some of them, they've even gone down. For most of them, they've remain the same, okay? This is an average. The next graph is gonna show you how this is, what's going on inside, and this is by uh, education. But this is basically the main kind of fact that wages have stagnated since the 1980s. So let's now 
split this up between different levels of education, those with high school so, or less, so basically until uh, 18, then those with two years of college, some professional degree, four years of college, a full uh, uh, university degree, and then those who have more than four years, like a, a, an MBA, uh, an LLM, a, a doctors, PhDs, things like that. And so what we see, we, we normalize their wages in, this is in 1963, the first year we have data for that, we look at their wages, normalize everything to one, and then see how it changes over time. And again, what you see is that until 1980, mid-1980s, they evolve together, and then from the 1980s, this is spreading out. Okay. One thing that won't surprise you is that those with professional degrees, and as I said earlier, I didn't include those in my graph before, these are managers, these are less than 10% of the whole workforce, these wages have gone up substantially, they've gone up 45% since uh, uh, the 60s. Those with a college degree have seen some increase with a four-year college degree, about 15%. Those with a two-year college degree have stagnated, have exactly the same wage, more or less. And strikingly, those with high school degrees have seen a decline in their wages by 10 to 15%. Okay. Now, one thing to note here is that, you know, as economists, we say, the wage in a competitive market reflects your productivity. So if your wage goes down, that must mean that your productivity goes down. Now, this is very hard to believe because if you think about, you know, let's say even the lowest skill jobs, I think of service skill jobs like a security guard or maybe someone who drives a truck or a car. Okay, I don't think that their productivity probably hasn't gone up much, but I don't think it has gone down. If anything, you know, with many of these jobs, their productivity might have gone up because there's better monitoring technologies. So you can follow them by GPS, you know, where the truck is all the time. Or, um, you know, a driver is going to be more efficient because now you have better directions. You have your apps to know where to go. So at least I wouldn't think that their productivity has gone down. Okay. So now we see that for some groups, the productivity has gone down by about 15%. Okay. And I think what... Is this the US? Or this is the US, but we have similar data for... Uh, the thing is that the European data is much harder to compare across countries. <laughs> um, so, so what we see is we see a, a drop in the... Uh, in, in Not in the productivity, but, you know, basically the share that they get from the total amount that they produce, okay? And, and so... The, the whole kind of uh, uh, idea or the, the mechanism that's going on is that the whole pie is being divided in a different way today. And then we get to the, uh, to the reason uh, why that is. Let me, before I show you, kind of talk about why that is, let me talk about one last fact, which is maybe something that's kind of less direct, but it's, it's important, what we call uh, business dynamism. Okay. And, and this is measured by a, a statistic that we call the job reallocation rate, which means that what percentage of all the jobs get changed through hiring, through uh, uh, firing, through promotions and things like that. And in the uh, early 80s, that was 35% of all jobs. Today, it's around 25%. So there's a big decline in this. You think, well, maybe this is good. Jobs are more stable, but it also means that there's much less promotions going on. Okay, so it's much harder for people that the social mobility is much lower. Okay, so these are the, the fact. And the question is, why is this going on? On the one hand, we see this enormous profitability of some firms. Let's say, you know, I think it's probably about 400 global firms, which are, you know, all names that we all know and that are, you know, we use it all the time because these are the firms that we... We, we use their products and services uh, all the time. It's a small number, but very large and dominant firms. Okay. On the one hand, they're doing extremely well. And on the other hand, we see these majority of the firms who have a much harder time. We see the small firms like these startups who have a much harder time. And then we see all these consequences on the labor market in terms of salaries, in terms of inequality, in terms of the business dynamism that, uh, uh, that measures basically how much rotation there is uh, within firms. And so the question is, what are the possible explanations? And, and what we see in the data is that, that the extent or the degree to which there is competition between firms has, has decreased. And so with less competition, what that means is firms can sell their goods at higher prices. 
What that means is that less of it is sold. You know, they get a higher return on it because higher price but lower quantity, but th that's why the firm does it in the first place. But the quantity is de declining. And if the quantity is declining, you get basically in the aggregate a decline in the production. And if the production is declining, you get a decline in the demand for labor. And if you get a decline in the demand for labor, wages decline. And that's what you know what we see in the data that's consistent with these facts is that we see this decline in the labor demand and therefore the decline in wages. I say decline in wages relative to productivity. Productivity is going up. So wage stagnation is really a decline in wages relative to the product. So we've become, we continue to become more productive, but at the same time, we didn't see that translated in, in, in uh, wages. And it, the simplest way to see this is, is that there's this increasing wedge between the productivity and the wages due to the fact that some of these this productivity are, are kept as profits okay, by these uh, dominant firms. So now, why is that the case? One of the things, you know, when we started working with this, our first reaction was this is policy. And I think this is part of it is policy. You know, our quantitative results show that it's just a small part. Policy, you can think that the, the way in which mergers and acquisitions are now allowed compared to in the 70s is much more lenient. And this leads to basically a larger uh, uh, number of uh, uh, MAs that shouldn't have happened and that therefore result in much more market power. And, 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 and we see some of that. And, and when we come to the, the, the kind of things, what are the things we can do? This is gonna be an, an important way to think about it. But whatever we see in terms of measuring, and this is now the type of things that we look at, like intangible capital has increased a lot. Uh, uh, the type of products uh, that are related to, to tech has become more and more dominant. And so, you know, what we find that quantitatively, the role of, you know, technological change is much more important. And so that's why 1980 is this key moment, because 1980 is basically... Yes. Is this me? Oh, no, so, what, what, um, you know, what this technological change in the in the eighties started to do is, you say, of course, we had these new technologies. They had been around in the seventies. In fact, Apple and and Microsoft were founded in the seventies. You go back to the sixties; they started to use these mainframes and things like that. But I think from an economic point of view, in terms of how much of an impact it starts to have is the 1980s when most households and firms started to use personal computers and servers. And in the 90s, we get the whole kind of internet. Uh, in the 2000s, we start with the mobile phones and the smartphones, and then there's big data, and it's kind of different levels of evolution. And, and it looks like 1980 is this moment where this all starts to have economic uh, uh, meaning. And so this, this fast technological change is then, you know, I always say it's, it's in, the, in the movie of the, of the uh, economy, it's both the hero and the villain. It's the hero because we need the technological change to make progress and to see, you know, how much of the productivity growth and how much of the GDP growth is actually driven by this technological change. But at the same time, it's the villain because much of this new technology is also allowing firms to keep out competition. I use this, ah, I'm gonna come back to that one in a second. I use this image, which is uh, Warren Buffett, a few, uh, maybe about 15 or 15 years ago, gave a speech. And he said, you know, what I want when I invest in a company, I think of a company as a castle. Okay? And I want the castle to be valuable. And then I want the person, the duke or whoever is running the castle to be someone who's honest, who's knowledgeable and who's competent, okay, to take care of the castle. But above all, when I invest, I want there to be a big moat around the castle. And the reason I want there to be a big moat around the castle because I don't want anyone to get in there. 
And so he says, you know, the value of a firm comes from the fact that it's basically not kind of contestable from other firms, that other firms cannot compete for whatever the products they sell or com cannot compete in the market in which uh, that you sell. And I think the new technologies have been extremely good at creating these modes. They've been extremely good at creating these modes because where does a mode come from? A mode comes basically from increasing returns to scale, as we say, scale economies. That is, if you do something at a large scale, it's efficient to do it at a large scale, and it gives you a natural monopoly. Okay. If I have you know, a technology that allows me to do it best in a large scale, then, you know, of course, no competitor can go in. Let me give you the example of, and I think that's where a lot of the, the new technologies are uh, uh, currently creating these, these scale economies. Think, think of platforms, you know, something like eBay or, or the social networking uh, platforms. What happens on eBay is that it's most valuable the more users, buyers and sellers there are. If I want to, you know, sell this uh, this pointer, I want to go there where there's a lot of potential buyers, and the buyers want to go where there's a potential, a lot of potential sellers, and and these what we call network effects create economies of scale. You could say, well, maybe we want to have competition by two networks, but then I have two half networks, and so we don't have as much scale on these two half networks as we have on this one network, and it's clear that this has been going on with these. Uh, especially with this eBay network, because Yahoo Auctions for many years has tried to come into this market. And where, you know, they try to compete. They try to compete, and they always said the way we compete is on, on offering lower fees, because eBay asks for 6 or 7% for each transaction, and Yahoo Auctions came in and said we do it for half a percent. And still the customers didn't switch, the buyers and the sellers, because they said, sure, it's cheaper there, but there's no one there. Why would I go there to not find you know, enough people wanting to buy it if I have something to sell? And so this allowed eBay to continue to charge these high prices for, without any danger of losing that market. Because once you have that market, you, you, know, you don't have to do anything to, to keep them because they want to be there because everyone else is there. Okay? And these network externalities are particularly beneficial with these new technologies, of course, this has existed before. You know, newspapers, in a sense, are also a little bit like that, okay? because you bring together uh, uh, readers who, at the same time, look at advertisements, and so you know, scale matters there too. But for some reason, with new technologies, it's become also global. Because with newspapers, for a long time, has have also been fairly local. You know, you had a, a newspaper made in any in each uh, town, but now this has become much more global because you can reach customers everywhere because you don't have to physically be somewhere and to buy and sell well with shipping costs declining you can ship anything anywhere and that has created uh, these these big advantages and the new technologies have a lot of that it doesn't have to be necessarily um it doesn't have to be necessarily network externalities it could also be just pure scale as in the case of amazon amazon has some network effects for sure but they also have the advantage of scale through their logistics which is just a matter of building that logistics uh, uh, operation, which means that the bigger the scale is, the more efficient it is to have such a, a, a large um, uh, a logistics uh, uh, operation. Now, this is not new, because if you go back in history, we've seen it before. Um, the, I would say the last big wave of technological change and fast technological change was around the 1900s when we had the, the, the second industrial revolution. And then it was electricity, it was rail travel, it was oil exploration, it was telephone and telegraph. And these technologies also had something very similar to that. You know, they created new markets and these new markets had a lot of scale advantages. By the way, there was a lot of competition to get it, just in the same way that there was a lot of competition to get into this market first. You know, Amazon didn't get it for free and eBay didn't get it for free. Initially, they had to compete a lot. And so as we say, there's a lot of competition for the market, but once you have, with these modes around it, you have that market, there's no competition in the market. Okay? And that's precisely what generates these large uh, 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 kind of scale economies and what generates basically this lack of competition in, in, in the market. 
And it's clear that what happened in 1900 was similar, but it was a much more physical technology. It wasn't, you know, now it's digital, but it was physical, but ultimately the, 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 the characteristics were very similar. The ones who came in there were the first ones to develop those markets, really managed to maintain that, uh, uh, that market. Now, even today, rail travel for sure, oil exploration to a large extent, electricity for sure, is still a highly regulated market and we haven't really solved it. If you let electricity production and pricing just completely free like in you know, an unregulated market, you get one firm, at least in one local market. It's gonna be a pure monopoly because scale is everything from that network. The way we do it now is we have, you know, maybe we haven't solved it properly yet because electricity markets are still problematic, but it's clear that you, you know, you want to create some form of competition. At the same time, you want to uh, exploit the size and the scale of that network. And I think with the new technologies, it's, it's going to be very similar. The first thing is we have to recognize that these, if you tell, for example, an eBay, eBay says, yeah, but we have that market because first of all we were there first and we were we were better at it okay. it's not entirely true that their network is better because if you look at japan yahoo auctions was there first and and yahoo auctions managed to get the market and ebay could never get into the japanese market so this doesn't confirm that ebay has a better platform by the way anyone who does computer science now you know with a computer science degree you can you can program a, a, an ebay platform i mean it's not that hard it's not, it's not that it was it was innovative back then in the, in the 90s but today this is not about a severe technology this is about being there first and having that you know have, having that that mass of, of users who, who find it very difficult to switch because you know why would you switch and so then the question is is you know getting to what is it that we can do about this and the type of things we can do about this is you know to a large extent i think has to come from fomenting more competition, basically firms that enter into this market and compete against each other. Now there's, that's easier said than done if you have these scale advantages. Okay. I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, some of the market power comes from just firms doing a lot of m &A activity and taking over other firms and having these advantages just because they killed the competition. I think for many of those firms, it probably makes sense to still split them up. So I think, you know, Facebook shouldn't have been allowed to merge with, with WhatsApp and with Instagram or um, the brewer, Interbrew and Anheuser-Busch should never have been allowed to merge because now they have 25, 30% of the whole world market. I mean, it's clear that they did this to, to gain market power. And the studies that we see shows that this is not because now it's more efficient. They should find very little or no evidence of synergies and they see big uh, increases in, in prices. But for most of these technological firms that created this, you know, mode through the technology, splitting them up is not going to be the answer. Having two eBays is not the answer to have more competition. And so the answer then, and it's again easier said than done, but, but some of the answers come from what people in, 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 IT call interoperability that is making sure that you know you separate somehow the network and the value of the size from the ones who operate on it. So you have operators on it that compete against each other with at the same time maintaining the large network that gives you the advantage of the scale, which is precisely where the, where the, the value is. The simplest way I think to do that would be that you have a regulator that tells eBay, you know, other sellers are allowed on, and I don't mean customers, other operators are allowed on your network. They have to pay you a rental fee for your network use. Okay, but then they're gonna to start to compete in prices and their fees are gonna come down from 6% probably to that half percent that Yahoo Auctions uh, was, was willing to offer. And that's basically gonna erode the natural monopoly that, that uh, uh, eBay has. eBay, of course, is not gonna like this at all because this is gonna eat into their uh, profits and and if you follow the, the the conflict between the app store from apple and, and epic games the distributor of um, uh, what's the game called again uh, 
Fortnite. Fortnite. Okay. Uh, you know who the gamers are here. <laughs> 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 um, what, what, you know, it's clear that Apple is charging 30% for each of the transaction and they say, yeah, sure, set up your own shop. Okay. So, of course, you know, the firm says, I treat it as if I've innovated and this is my, my shop. I can charge whatever price, but this is clearly treating this shop, this online shop with this network as if it's a butcher shop. Okay? And of course, with butcher shops, you don't need to regulate them, have a price. And if one is you know, making better sausages and sets prices, maybe that are higher because the sausages are better than people are going, and that's, you know, that's perfectly fine in terms of competition. But it's different if you set prices that are high because you have these scale economies. Okay? And that, that's, that's a very different uh, uh, explanation. And, and, and so with interoperability, the idea is to separate basically the network from the, the operators. We see it in reality, I think in Spain, there's two cases here. One is now on rail travel, we see the, the fast trains that are being operated by competing operators. So the French are now on, on uh, offering uh, Barcelona Madrid. And then we also see it with the mobile phone plans. Um, this is hidden for most people, but my mobile phone plan in the United States with AT&T cost about two and a half times what it costs here. Okay, and the technology is the same. I use the same mobile phone device. I, they have the same technology, 4G or 5G. They have the same uh, cell tower network. So there's no difference. So why is the price so much higher there? Well, the reason is because there's a, a piece of regulation in Europe that Basically, uh, the regulator forces owners of a cell tower network to allow competing uh, cell phone providers to use that network. And so I'm a Polish provider who comes into the uh, Spanish market and I say, I want to start here. I can go to Movistar and say, you know, at this price set by the regulator, I can use your towers. And then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to sell my phone plan at a price which is below your plan and we're going to start to compete and you see the prices coming down. You have the advantage of these large networks that if the price is set right and that's the job of the regulator, you get the advantage of having enough quality networks, uh, but at the same time you also have the competition which uh, separates this um, this network from, from, from the providers. So, um, and then the last thing, I, and this is something I would like to, to hear back from, from uh, you, there is, of course, a, a, a legal issue in, 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 you know, we can think, okay, let's, let's look at the existing laws and we can go to the Sherman Act in the United States and then the European laws in terms of, of uh, uh, antitrust. But there is one thing that you never hear in the discussions about uh, uh, enforcement, which is something that we see very much in the data, which is the following. When I say there's wage stagnation or startups decline, this is a, an economy-wide effect. It's not that Google is paying badly to its workers. It's not that they are directly, you know, we call that monopsony and there's some evidence of that too. But it's not that these dominant firms pay lower wages. In fact, everyone wants to work there because the terms are very good. One of the reasons is because they attract very high skilled workers. So it's not the typical low skilled workers. So that's not the problem. The problem is that we have Google, we have Facebook, we have Amazon, we have Inditex here, we have ABM, that we have Bertelsmann, we have worldwide a few hundred firms that are dominant, set, sell at high prices. This is again the same mechanism, produce less, therefore have lower wage, uh, lower labor demand, and this, this depresses the wages. That's the mechanism. So there is no relationship between Google and these lower wages directly. In the same way that there's no relationship between someone who uses a car and you know someone around the corner gets asthma because there's three billion cars in in the world and there's you know all kinds of CO2 emissions that cause asthma, and I cannot attribute the asthma of one person to that one car. The same way I cannot attribute the um, the, the lower wage of the person who delivers your Globo to the fact that Google is actually having market power or that Facebook is having market. And so, you know, I, my understanding is that legally, in the same way that it's very hard to, to deal with, with these large externalities, such as pollution, we have something similar here too. Of course, the solution would be that we can take every individual firm and reduce their market power. 
Because if you do it all jointly, you know, but in, in, in the current debate, the only thing that we use is something that's relevant in terms of the implications that it has is that anything that's directly attributable to the actions of that firm. Whereas any of these, you know, externalities are completely left out um, uh, uh, of the picture. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts, you know, on everything that we've talked about, but also in particular on, on, on the legal implications of these uh, economy-wide or society-wide uh, uh, impacts of, uh, of, of market power. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, let me, should I start? Yes. Uh, so thank you so much. And um, is there any question from um, anybody online? <laughs> 